Hi everyone, my name is Justin Lung. I'm a postdoc at UC Davis in plant sciences. Thanks for joining me today for my talk at Botany 2022 on my dissertation about how grassland restoration in California increases native plant cover, but promotes biotic homogenization. Before we get started, I wanna acknowledge that the research and work on which this land took place was the unceded territories of the Shumash, Selenian, Kostanoan, Amamutsin, Ohlone, Miwok, Pomo, Matol, Wiat, and other indigenous tribal bands, which were taken by the to the missions during Spanish colonization during across the California coast, and are currently working towards healing from historical trauma and colonization. I also want to thank the numerous restoration practitioners that made my work possible, as well as my advisors, um, my numerous volunteers and student workers and interns, and my uh, generous funding supports as well, as you can see listed. Although restoration has been documented to be occurring since the 1980s, there's a large uncertainty in restoration outcomes and a lot of variability. Um, a lot of times because we don't know, um, we don't monitor restoration outcomes and starting conditions can often also be very variable. On the photos on the right, you can see three different transects from a single restoration site I monitored. Even from this site, you can see how much variability there is in planting outcomes. Most grassland restoration projects lack funds to conduct rigorous post-implementation monitoring, which prevents them from knowing if they achieve project goals. This also means many projects are not able to apply adaptive management in practice and practices because there's insufficient data about their previous restoration. Projects that do often have funds are only able to monitor immediately after implementation or for a short duration thereafter, like five years. Thereafter, making outcomes of projects past five years relatively unknown. Experimental restoration studies in a variety of ecosystems show that outcomes have a high degree of variability caused by environmental stochasticity, limited resources, and insufficient knowledge about local natural history um, to facilitate planting and seeding success. Ecological restoration requires direct human intervention, and as such will be shaped by the person or persons undertaking the restoration. It has been shown in various studies that socioeconomic, political, and management factors play defining roles in shaping ecological outcomes, and even more so in projects with direct human intervention, like restoration. For example, the surrounding parcels and their views and perspectives may influence or limit the types of practices in restoration agency can undertake, such as maybe fire or herbicide. On the other hand, a land manager's interest or influence may drive or generate restoration projects with unused funds, whereas uninterested people might pursue other conservation projects. Somewhere that has access to machinery from nearby agricultural parcels might also use similar practices as nearby farmers, whereas agencies with high staff or volunteer labor may be more akin to doing hand removal. Some may even have different species preferences or different landscape aesthetics. As such, management practices greatly differ across agencies and even within agencies among different practitioners. Accordingly, restoration project goals also differ. Goals may also differ depending on whether a project is statutory, meaning it's legally mandated, or non-statutory, meaning it's not legally mandated or voluntarily undertaken. The commonality that does continue to tie most grassland restoration projects together, though, is that they are often fund limited. To better understand coastal grassland restoration outcomes and how they fared years after implementation, I asked three questions. First, does coastal grassland restoration meet project-based goals and a standard performance metric? Next, is native cover related to project age? And finally, what are the biggest barriers to achieving restoration goals? To answer these questions, I first identified 37 projects spanning along a 1,000 kilometer north-south climate gradient from Santa Barbara, California to Humboldt, California. To locate projects, I contacted numerous universities and colleges in each of those areas to see if they could identify restoration. I also contacted land trusts, nonprofits, and local nature reserves to see if they had completed restoration or knew of nearby projects. I then reached out to my known contacts from previous work in restoration in these areas and by identifying local restoration agencies. Initially, I contacted about 150 people from the search, which led me to make new contacts. 
I later learned from my interviews that there may be up to 48 sites that fit my criteria that could have been surveyed, indicating that I surveyed about two thirds of existing coastal grassland rest re restoration sites that fit my criteria within this range. Sites selected were at least three years post implementation in 2019, were actively planted or seeded larger than one acre and typically receive summertime fog. I selected projects three years and older because first year results can often vary widely and plants may experience high mortality or in some cases grow slow and not achieve higher cover until later years. The projects I identify range from three to 30 years post implementation by 2019 and range from one to 32 acres. I conducted vegetation surveys in 2019, 2020, and 2021. In 2019, I surveyed the original 32 sites I identified. In 2020, I couldn't gain access to all the sites due to COVID-19 restrictions and timing and sampled 20 sites. In 2021, I resurveyed most of the original sites and five new projects identified from management interviews undertaken after the first year of field surveys, totaling 34 sites. I estimated absolute plant cover of all plant species and ground, ground cover types in quarter meter quadrat squares every five meters along 50 meter transects. I used a minimum of three and a maximum of 16 transects depending on the site size. Before conducting field vegetation surveys, I conducted project document analyses to assess original project goals, resource levels, and plant selection. Only 11 of 37 projects actually had project documents but often did not have all the data I needed. After conducting vegetation surveys in 2019, I conducted semi-structured interviews with at least one restoration practitioner from each project. Semi-structured interviews have guiding questions, but are loosely structured so that the participant can lead the discussion. Because some practitioners worked on multiple projects I surveyed, they may be linked to more than one project. Thus, there were less than 36 interviews. When possible, I interviewed two people from each project and in total interviewed 26 practitioners. Interviews focused on the largest barriers to success, implementation strategies, and helped fill in important information for the projects that had no document or missing information within their documents. We found that all but one project were successful at reaching their project-based goals and that most projects, about 80%, were successful at reaching a standard performance metric that we had set to be 25% native cover and six native species because remnant systems in this area often have difficulty maintaining high cover in grasslands and because that target is similar to the lowest level target for compliance projects. The graph on the right shows projects that met the standard performance metric 25% native cover or um, needed improvement or fell or was close to reaching the target. The dark gray bar indicates successful projects, about 81%, whereas the light gray bar indicates the 6% of projects that meet the species richness goal, but at most five, fall 5% 5 short from the standard cover goals. And the tan bars show the 13% of projects that need further improvement and did not reach the standard performance metric. Interestingly, we were able to survey more restoration projects that are voluntary comp compared to legally mandated or statutory. Um, and this is often because voluntary sites were always willing to let us come and survey their sites, whereas we were denied access from at least six statutory projects, even though there was an equal amount of uh, voluntary and statutory projects within the pool. Voluntary sites also often had higher species richness, whereas mandated projects or statutory projects often achieved lower non-native cover. We found that labor investment affects restoration outcomes. Specifically, increased labor can help projects achieve higher species richness and lower non-native cover, as indicated in the box plots. So in the box plots here in the upper, you can see the native species richness on the Y, and then on the lower, you can see the non-native species richness. On the X axis, you can see low labor investment, medium labor investment, and high labor investment. Low labor investment is just is either no maintenance or uh, annual maintenance, untargeted. Medium is about one targeted uh, invasive control per year. Um, and high is multiple targeted events, as well as supplemental planting and seeding. We found that increased labor increases native species richness and decreases non-native plant cover. But we found that funding was not directly correlated to plant metrics. And this could be because funding was also related 
um, to other high costs of construction, such as, for example, ripping up asphalt from an old lumber mill. One of the really important and interesting findings from this study was that coastal prairie restoration may be causing regional biotic homogenization. Biotic homogenization is the reduction of biological diversity through dominance of a few key species. 88% of restoration practitioners across the entire span of restored coastal grasslands indicated use of eight key species because they believe they either have better survival or grow faster to meet project goals. In other words, at a regional scale, species may be becoming more similar over time due to restoration. In this table, we can see the frequency each species is used across 37 projects, where green N sites are northern, C blue sites are central, and S orange sites are southern. And here we can see that all of these species are actually perennial bunch grasses, with the exception of Achelia millifolium, which is a ubiquitous circumboreal forb. And so we may think that this could be potentially contributing to the perennialization of California grasslands, as noted in a previous study. In conclusion, we found that coastal California grassland restoration was largely successful at reaching both project-based goals and the 25% native cover standard performance metric. These findings are exciting because both me, the, my advisors, and the practitioners I spoke with thought grassland restoration in the area was being lost to invasive species. However, there is some room for improvement because management interviews indicated that practitioners across this 1,000 kilometer range are using eight similar species because they grow better or can help achieve project goals, which is understandable, but means we will have to think a little bit more in the future about how to diverse species palette and coordinate species use across the state. Finally, we also found that increased maintenance and labor help improve restoration outcomes in terms of increasing species diversity and also reducing non-native plant cover. With that, I wanna thank you all again for listening today and attending my talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Botany 2022 experience, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.